This week on the show, 60 minutes to convert my guest, Austin Molden, even Jungle Pastor, to Catholicism. <laughs> it's fantastic. Here we go. Hey guys, welcome to the show. Okay, this is going to be an absolutely off the hook episode, I think. Uh, I have Austin Mould. He's a pastor at New Vintage Church in Richland, Washington. He's passionate about helping people go deeper in their understanding of the Bible and leading people to an encounter the presence of God. At an early age, he felt the call on his life to preach and travel around the world, uh, the world, the nation, maybe worldwide, too, speaking. Uh, he's married to the love of his life, McKenna, since 2017. They have a daughter named Ellen. Elliot, a son named Bowden, and he is a Portland Trailblazer fan. That's basketball, I understand. And is hoping to one day become a grandmaster in chess. Uh, and he's our guest today, guys. Austin, welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. And hello. Yes, hello. It's great to be here as well. And I followed you for um I, I don't know how long. It's probably, I don't know, a year and a half, two years. And I appreciate the yeah. stuff you do. So I'm glad we get to finally talk. This is great. I'm I'm thrilled to have this discussion. It's gonna be a lot of fun. Um, I wanna say for full full clarity, for full honesty, uh, transparency sake, I had to look up two things in your bio. It was uh, what WA stood for, because I'm Canadian. And I thought, what state's WA? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea. Yeah, yeah. And just to, and to double check that the Trailblazers were a basketball team. So, yeah, yeah. Totally sure. <laughs> so I am off like on the wrong foot already austin but uh no problem. I'm, th I'm thrilled to have you on the show yeah. this is going to be a really fun i think and and fruitful conversation um the idea here that that you pitched to me was 60 minutes to convert you to catholicism so uh i want to give a, a few caveats at the beginning here and the first thing is i think you know this too and this is obviously tongue-in-cheek uh, you can't convert anybody to anything in 60 minutes, obviously, mm -hmm. um, I, you know, going from, and I've been in all these places, going from nothing to, to Christian, right, requires a movement of God in somebody's life, right? The Holy Spirit's got to draw you in. I think we agree on that. And I think mm -hmm. also like converting to anything, like, you know, going from evangelical Christian, you know, Protestant to Catholic, right? That's a, that's again, a, a, a kind of movement. And whether people might say, no, oh, that's movement in the wrong direction. That's not the Holy Spirit, that that's Satan or some other nefarious figure mm -hmm. or just ignorance or, you know, y'all being stupid. I think if that's a genuine movement, that's again, right from the Holy Spirit. So of course yeah. I'm not, I'm not going to, at the end of this night, give you, you know, make you swear the blood oath to the Pope and and rescind <laughs> all of your copies of the Bible to the shredder to now be become Catholic as as we do. Right. But I think that of course that that premise stands, right? There's 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 arguments to be made, conversation to be had. But of course all of these things are are of movement of the spirit. Right. Does that that mm -hmm. make sense? You I don't yeah. have words in your mouth. <laughs> no, no, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I don't maybe, just maybe you plan to shred all your Bibles at the end. Of the night. <laughs> I don't plan. On, even if I was to convert in the sixty minutes, I'm not going to shred all the Bibles. But that's yeah, what, that's what we do, though, Austin. Come on. Okay, you know what? Really Fine, gonna, I'll burn them. Yeah. How's that? Yes, burn them. Well, that yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't want to sort of fire anywhere else. The shredder right. is just more efficient, I think. For, yeah, totally. Okay, and, and th so and then it's, okay, so that's kind of it. One, three more thoughts, and it's this: I'm not an professional apologist, so full 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 disclosure to listeners, to viewers, I am not professional. Uh, I at, at apologetics. It's not my like my my pastime. I'm a guy who gets guys on my show to talk about you know their conversions, talk about things from the Catholic perspective. You know, I, I have some ideas, and I, mm -hmm. I definitely want to obviously try to convert you to Catholicism in 60 minutes. But I'm not. I, I don't have this game plan that I'm following that I'm, you know a seasoned apologist might follow. I do want to make a positive case for Catholicism, right? I, mm -hmm. I have one. I have had my own conversion experience. I was an evangelical Christian. I became Catholic for reasons I want to unpack. But I recognize too that those things are personal, right? So the things that that drew me in, if there's no felt need for a listener, you know, for you, Austin, or somebody else listening, th to resonate with those things, they just kind of, they they hit and they, they go nowhere, right? Unless somebody is, right. again, that movement of the spirit. And again, those things that have, Right, if I, I can list a million things. If you haven't even thought of those things, they haven't bothered you the same way that they bothered me as an evangelical, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's, we go nowhere. So I think in that, that's the first idea that I, I do want to make a positive case, but recognize that a lot of my own journey and journeys that I've, you know, had people on the show and talked to people, 
a lot of the, that journey begins with simply dispelling like misunderstandings and misconceptions you have about the Catholic faith. I think so much of what I try and do on my show and I have experienced because of experience this in my, in my own life was so many things that I thought I knew about Catholics, what they believed, what they practiced, were these things that were based on just misconceptions that I had about what Catholics actually believe. And in kind of, first of all, asking questions. So, hey, I, I heard you say that we, you know, Catholics worship Mary. Why do you think that, right? Or what do you think, what leads you to believe that Catholics worship Mary? Or what do you see Catholics doing that you think is worship? Like those kind of questions kind of dispels those misunderstandings. So I think a lot of the time in apologetics, asking good questions to kind of get to the root of why somebody holds, especially we're talking about Catholic Protestant apologetics, why somebody holds a, a misconception, asking those questions to get to that root is where the real fruit, I think, kind of begins. And you might find that, no, 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 they totally get what Catholics are doing with Mary and they still hate it or still disagree with it. And that's totally fine. Sure. Right. right, but at least to get to understanding why they think that, and if it is a misunderstanding, well, hey, let's then let's then clear that up. Mm -hmm. Right, Does that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, I think I commented this actually on one of your one of your videos, but I, um, you know, I grew up in a church that um, was a charismatic evangelical church, yeah, and. I love it. Um, I loved my pastor growing up. He had a master's in theology and a master's in, in, in history. And so he was a history nut and a theology nerd. And um, anyway, oh, hold on. Sorry. My light's going to fall off here. Um, <laughs> there we go. But um, anyways, all that being said, I grew up not because my pastor it was ever even talked about my church, but pretty much from some of my friends who came from a more Pentecostal background yep, yep. that uh, – Catholics were not saved. They don't have the full gospel. Um, it's a works-based salvation. And so then what happens is, you know, I study and I read more and I, and I do think there are some things, obviously I still disagree with um, on some of those issues, but you realize, oh, that's actually not what they believe, or that was a caricature of what they believe. And so then, um, yeah, the dominoes start falling. And uh, I've wrestled with a lot of different um, a lot of different angles on church tradition and you know the institution of the church and things like that. And um, I, I try I don't do this perfectly and I'll in my rant here, but I try to have this attitude of um, ideas are like a t-shirt and if I find a better one, I'll put it on. And that's not to say that I'm jumping, you know, ship to ship every year, just constantly changing. Shirt to but shirt. I, but I am, tr I am trying to be, I'm trying to be intellectually honest and go, um, man, I just want the truth. And so yeah. if that's where I'm at now, or if that's somewhere else, uh, I pray that I get led there. So, yeah, yeah, that, that's, that's very well said. I, you know, I, the, my background is very similar. I was, I became Christian at about the age of 13 or so. I, the, the church my friends went to was a evangelical, you know, Pentecostal, yeah. Uh, kind of Baptocostal, kind of sometimes charismatic, but certainly, you know, our, our youth rallies and those things where other Pentecostals gathered, those were the charismatic kind of hotbed stuff. And I feel like what you say is true. I think, you know, I grew up in that context, not necessarily hearing a lot of anti-Catholic stuff, but the kind of the air we breathed yeah. was anti-Catholic, right? When we talked about the Pharisees, it was kind of just known that, oh yeah, they're, they're the modern day Catholics. Like that's, that's the correlation, right? <laughs> when we talked about you know, we read Revelation, like, yeah, that's the Catholic Church we see in there doing those naughty things, right? It wasn't mm. explicitly kind of stated out loud, but it was just kind of yeah. in the in the air we breathed, right? And so you inherit these things. And of course, I always talk about the, the Catholics that I knew, like, you know, in high school and early university were those pretty crappy Catholics who were the guys who knew how to party the hardest or could find the best drugs in the best places. Right, right, right. I was, I was deep in the punk rock scene in high school and the guys who party the hardest were the Catholics, right? Who would sneak in the bottles of beer into the youth hall and, you know, drinking out back <laughs> and smoking out back in their Catholic school uniforms. Like those were the guys yeah. that, and that was the, and that just reinforced my understanding of, yeah, the Catholics yeah. aren't, they're not even saved. They're not living a Christian life. They're right. not saved. And you know what they weren't in many cases, looking back, those were guys who inherited, you know, a cultural Catholicism. They mm. were kind of living out, but weren't really, disciples of Christ, right? Right in the sense yeah. that we were trying to be in high school, of course, with all of our failings, right? And in hindsight, a lot of that too is kind of a triumphal, like prideful 
approach to that that we mm-hmm. were taken in high school but you, you said you grew up in an evangelical church was it part of a denomination was it non-denomination yeah, yeah it was pentecostal so up in up here in canada pentecostal assemblies of canada okay. was a denomination okay. uh, yeah and i i stuck with that for quite a while even the even the church we found as uh, in university was loosely pentecostal this is part mm-hmm. of my conversion story because they began to drift away from the pentecostal church on issues of gender and sexuality ah. and some of these kinds of things but certainly, you know, uh, good Pentecostal charismatic roots uh, mm-hmm. in my evangelical days, for yeah. sure. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. So I think I, I, I do, I want to ask some probing questions, but I think I want to begin in this conversation with that kind of positive case first, maybe. And I think the best way of doing this is just tracing kind of my own journey. I'm not a professional apologist. So yeah, neither what makes I. sense to me is to describe how, you know, my own movement, my own experience. And I know from, you know, guests I've had on my show doing this for the last five years, the two top things that people talk about, right, are is the early church and the issue of authority. And for mm-hmm. me, those are the things that drew me into. And so if I were to give a positive case for Catholicism, I would say the authority that's found in the Catholic Church the authority to judge between different ideas, different issues in scripture to kind of make a concerted like, okay, this is it, this is the case, we're done, case closed. That authority that exists in the Catholic Church, I would say is one thing that that drew me in, and I think should should stand as a a beacon to draw Mm -hmm. others in. And the witness of the early church, right? Which, Which I think also comes, those two things kind of come hand in hand. And I would say for me, well, first of all, you know, the, the authority issue, I mentioned a second ago, like, you know, we were, we were steeped in the Bible, like you know, Bible studies up the wazoo, like read scripture, loved scripture, still do, despite my earlier comments about starting Bibles, Catholics do read Bibles, the, the, <laughs> we love our Bible too. You know, steeped in scripture, and I began to encounter like those issues, right, those issues where, okay, two of us disagree on this scripture, say in a, in a small Bible study, how do we discern between who's right? Like that really basic kind of level of, of discourse, right? Mm-hmm. And, I, and I found, I guess, you know, my earliest experience of this was actually in youth group when a guy began reading Calvin and brought in Calvinist ideas into our Pentecostal youth group. Uh-oh. And suddenly, suddenly all these teenagers were like, wait a minute, we're reading the same Bible. How come this guy over here says all these things mean this. And the senior mm-hmm. pastor had to come in and lecture our youth group to explain what Pentecostals believed about predestination and Calvinism yeah. and stuff, right? That was like my first kind of, you know, red flag or encounter with that. And then as I began to grow up in Christianity, right? I, I would encounter those moments where I'm like, wait a minute, we are reading the same scripture, wrestling with the same passages. We're both praying really hard or we're both, it's sometimes bringing, you know, you know, fasting and bringing this to serious discernment, bringing mm-hmm. this to the elders in our church, and we're still, the two of us, disagreeing. So how does this, how does this make sense? And then that became a kind of bigger issue for me when our denomination, you know, our, our church that we've been to, been my wife and I have been a part of for a while, began to wrestle with some issues around questions like this, around, around some of these more emergent issues in evangelical Christianity, right? Gender, sexuality, these kinds of questions, even issues of denominationalism and like membership. What does membership mean in our church? We had no idea of membership at this point. We were, you know, a, a growing church. So how do you join this church and say you're a member? And, so, and we realized in that process that people had different ideas and people who are taking the same scriptures had different ideas and couldn't come to a conclusion. And I can remember in so many cases with different friends wrestling through these things and going, you know what, I wish there was a way of just knowing who was right, who had the right interpretation of this scripture. And I can remember getting to a point where we're thinking, and this is, you know, I, and I have friends who are on this journey who deconstructed and left Christianity, right? For mm. very similar reasons to why I became Catholic. We, we had our Bibles, we wrestled with these things, we couldn't come to a conclusion they kind of went, well, there's no conclusion. This is all, this is all bunk. Right, right. And left after, you know, a lifetime of Christianity, you know, I kind of went, well, there's got to be a better way. Mm-hmm. And not that I'm better than them. That, that, that sounds terrible, me saying, I did this and they left. But, right. you know, I, I answered those same questions in a different way. And my way was to go, okay, this system seems broken. The system where we're able to look at our Bibles, even in a denominational context, even with elders and an authority structure in my denomination, Something seems broken if we can't look at our Bible 
and it's clear enough to come to a conclusion on on really important things, right? Not not small things, not that sexuality and marriage are, are small, but even on big things, like how are we saved? Can we lose that salvation? Does baptism right. save or, or not? Do we baptize babies or not? You know, what what constitutes sin and what and what doesn't? These these big issues, I kind of realize, well, it seems like to me the system is broken if we can't discern these things. Is there another way? And I began to, you know, look into the history of Christianity to see how they did this in history. Mm-hmm. Right. And of course, here comes my like my revelation right where the anti-catholic air that i breathed kind of filtered my church history and i began to read from actual right not just acts of the apostles and then like the reformation you know the in-between sure. stuff i went wait a minute there were all kinds of ecumenical councils and bishops got together and and decided on these big major things and here's the catholic church that understands that that authority that you know christ gave the apostles still exist today and can discern on issues like mm-hmm. this, right? So mm-hmm. that was kind of my first, you know, one of those two, you know, drives to convert was encountering that question of authority and realizing that there was a different way to settle, you know, disputes around authority and a way that I think made more sense of historical Christianity mm-hmm. and then made more sense of, of this system of, well, how do we do this? Right. Right. Does that make sense? I'm gonna take a drink and, and let and let yeah, you, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, it, may, it makes total sense. I think there is something one one hundred percent appealing to Protestants about. Uh, I mean, at least to me, about what you just said. Uh, you know, one of the things I've thought through, and I, um, I've seen this with people, including myself, on whatever aisle. You know, they grew up in, and they they learn something about the other side, and it's like, oh my gosh, and there's this feeling of. In fact, I was just talking to a, a, a gal in my church um, last Sunday who grew up LDS, and you know, is exploring the faith and is now wanting to get baptized. She was baptized as an eight year old in the temple, and she's wanting to, you know, follow Jesus and all, all these different things. And I, and she, I remember her telling me, yeah some of my siblings like have just totally lost faith in any sort of organized religion, any sort of God. And she goes, I just didn't want to do that. I didn't know where to start, but I just started with the Bible, like reading the new Testament. And I start, you know, and I thought, man, that's not the case for a lot of people who leave the LDS faith, because sometimes you realize one thing's wrong and it leads this domino effect. And so I do think um, I, I tried not to go, Oh my gosh, I was wrong about this thing that the Catholics taught and they're right about it. Therefore, everything they say is true. It's like there's still some more digging <laughs> to do, enough. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, one of the things I've thought about on the exactly on what you just mentioned was um, like recently Richard Dawkins, who you know, world renowned atheist, um, who just recently said, I think like a month ago, that he is, you know, culturally a Christian. Yeah. And, you know, people were saying that about Jordan Peterson uh, years ago that like, you know, it's not really clear, that, you know, this is maybe a li- little bit like two, three years ago. It's not really cl- clear what he believes, but at least he thinks this is good for society. And then you have Richard Dawkins come out who so clearly doesn't believe in Jesus yeah. or the resurrection, but he goes, yeah, this is actually probably pretty good for society. <laughs> I'm trying to make the distinction when you're talking about the need for an office or an authority to decide between, you know, the example you gave was some two different people arguing about Calvinism or something like that in your youth ministry uh, growing up, but going, is that something to be desired because functionally it is um, a good idea or, you know, kind of like I'm culturally a Christian, you know, I don't really believe it, but this functionally makes sense versus a theological truth. And I'm not saying it's not theologically true, but that was kind of the first, um, thing I had to think through when I was thinking about how do we know and decide which interpretation of the Bible is correct. And I've been on that journey for a while. I've been trying to think through it. Um, I, I know we probably come to different conclusions on that, but um, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Throw some thoughts. so I, I think two things here. I think there must be, there must be a, well, there is, I would argue a way that Jesus told us to resolve disputes like this. Right. And I think, I think in light of that, I think in light of John 17, 
right? There must be a way, right? So Christ prays for Christian unity. He prays for, you know, in, in the one kind of verse that he prays for us in, right? In the Bible, they, he's looking forward and praying for all future believers who would hear the apostles' words and, you know, and read scripture, read the Bible. And he's praying for, for all of us. And he wants us to be as close as he is with the Father, right? Which is an absolute closeness mm-hmm. like you can't even fathom, right? Which tells me, I mean, this is, again was part of my journey, in, encountering that in Scripture and really wrestling with that, that Christ wants us as Christians not to have this kind of service level agreement on, on things or not to just agree to disagree or not just kind of look like we're in agreement but not actually, you know, mm-hmm. just kind of work together or cooperate, right? But actually be as close as he and the Father is, which, which speaks to, to me, a real physical, tangible, kind of visible unity, right? Mm-hmm. And he says in there too, that unity is how others will know him. Like the, you know, mm-hmm. the witness, you know, Christ's witness on earth is, is affected in a real yeah. sense by how that unity appears. If it's a real unity, like, you know, a false unity, whatever, yeah. like that's contingent. And that's, that to me was like deeply convicting that, okay, I, I got to find something that can, that can do that. Right. And the second thing was right. Matthew is Matthew 18, Matthew 18. Yeah. Matthew 18, 15, the idea of how you deal with disagreement or sin in the church. Right. Mm -hmm. And this is the idea that, okay, so if we disagree, right. Or if you're sinning and I, I I catch in that, I bring it to you. If you don't agree with me, I bring it to a couple other people. And if that doesn't work, then I bring this dispute we have Mm -hmm. to the church. Right. And I, and I actually brought that verse to a couple of pastors that I knew as I was kind of on my journey and say, okay, so we are, we are Pentecostal. We are a local church, Pentecostal is our denomination. We're Protestants broadly. How do we actually implement this, this Bible verse? This is, this is to me the, the mechanism that Christ gave us to resolve disputes in amongst believers yeah if you and me disagree great i bring one more if we disagree still we bring it to the church but the thing is if the church says hey keith you're wrong this thing you're doing here is a sin or we don't believe that about salvation you can lose it and you're out of fellowship with us i can just go down the street right physically i can leave the church i am in leave the, leave the denomination and mm-hmm. go down the street to a different church that tells me i'm okay to believe that and i'm not out of fellowship right and i was like okay but first of all that doesn't make sense of john 17 because we aren't actually united as christians if i can just leave this one church and join a different church that disagrees with the first church because they those two churches don't jive they disagree mm-hmm. and second of all that doesn't seem like it was actually implementing what christ intended for us that framework doesn't seem to work if there's no like one single visible church i can bring this to because as it stands like that church has no authority whatsoever over me if i can be told no you're wrong and i can just leave that church and join a different church that agrees with me and my theology and this hit hard for me when i talked to a guy called dr john bergsma who's you know a bible scholar a convert himself who said you know i was i was pastor of a church you know in this town and this and this happened and i went wait a minute this doesn't seem right i can't be telling the congregation that they're wrong and they can up and leave and join the church over here that says they're okay right something something right. is broke something is broken here so i came to feel like that you know if christ is praying for unity and if christ is giving us a system to resolve disputes that can't actually physically work anymore mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right, my Anglican, my Anglican friend who would say, you know what, that's because we're humans and we're sinful and we broke that system. It can't be fixed anymore. And we can't have John 17. It's not possible. That's our fault. That's that's sin. I That's one approach, I guess. I feel like God is more intentional than that. It wouldn't give us standards we, that we, you know, in the year 2024 couldn't attain. That seems mm-hmm. like that seems like a you know a cups game like you can't you can't mm-hmm. win that thing so why right. is, why is that standard there right that's, that, that's that's one approach my approach is wait a minute mm-hmm. this we're doing something wrong if we can't implement this system mm-hmm. that Christ gave us and i and i couldn't yeah. see a way out of that yeah okay so a few thoughts and then uh, a few questions i would i would love to hear your thoughts on 
I don't I don't have the passage um, up in front of me right now. Are we? Uh, we're doing some projects in the back of the house normally where the normal setup is. And so I, I got one computer telling, wait, 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 wait a minute. The Catholic has the Bible out and the evangelical oh. is, is left grasping at some, okay. Let's I'm just, just going to ask the Holy Spirit to give me the answer. Okay? <laughs> yeah, okay. I'm just going to okay. ask for prophetic wait, I'm utterance. Still, I'm still curious about it too, man. We can, we can play this game. Uh, but, um, I, you know, I think the passage you brought up, if I remember correctly, uh, there, there does seem to be a sense of authority. There does seem to be a sense of governance in terms of, uh, you know, handling disputes and whatnot. But I don't know if those passages, and again, I'm saying this with humility because I don't, I can't remember them off the top of my head exactly. I'm trying to go, oh, wait, before I say this, is this right? But um, I don't know if those passages will speak to doctrinal matters. I mean, for a few reasons. One is... Um, I don't think it. I don't think it outlines it in the text. I, I do think it, there's authority there, but it's not speaking to doctrinal uh, matters, if if I remember correctly. The other part of it is that you know that I would think through on this subject is, um, you know, for me when I'm reading scripture, I um, I tr- I'm what I call a confessional Christian. So I confess what Christians have always confessed. And so I believe what, at least I think I do, I believe what the early church has believed on all the core tenets of the faith. Um, And so I have tried to read with the body of Christ. So um, with, but with that on doctrinal matters, again, I would say, I think that is somewhat desirable. But when when Jesus talks about unity, if I remember correctly, I don't think there's anywhere in the Bible that actually says that Christians or God's people in the Old Testament are to create unity. Um, We're we're simply to maintain unity. So the unity that we have in the New Testament is brought forth by the blood of Christ, as it says in Ephesians, um, that the wall of hostility has been broken down between Jew and Gentile. We are one in Christ. So I believe Keith, that you and I, we have we have a sense of unity that goes beyond any sort of ecclesi- ecclesiological differences or authority issues or something like that, because the blood of Christ has both covered you and I, and we're part of the family of God. We've both been grafted into the tree, if you will. So there's that sort of unity. There's a unity that's created by the Holy Spirit through the work of Christ to the Father. You're talking about um, an institutional authoritative, visible unity. So I just want to make those distinctions. I would agree yeah, yeah. to some extent. Yes, there is there is a, um, a unity there. But um, yeah, I mean, for me, you brought this up earlier that some things really mattered to you that were kind of dominoes that dropped down. And I think for me early on, this was probably one of them. The more I thought and studied this, the more this is just where I came to. I went, as I said earlier, functionally, this sounds incredible if we could dispute all these things. But I mentioned this in a video that I think you responded to. Um, and, and maybe you can shed light on this for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, the whole idea of infallibility, it doesn't make me like, you know, <laughs> think that's insane or something like that. I see the lo- the logic. I've, I've tried to actually really consider this honestly for quite a while. But um, I wrestle with this for a multitude of reasons, some of, the, some of which I quickly uh, brought up in the video, but for people listening or watching this, um, I can't find, when I've looked it up, a uh, an agreed upon list, and maybe I just don't know where to look, of where the church has infallibly defined all those things. And maybe there's just nuances there that I'm unaware of. Um but let's just start with that first point. Is that true? I don't see. I, I don't want to misrepresent the Catholic uh, yeah, yeah, understanding yeah. of that. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, infallibility is a, is a huge topic. And funny enough, you bring that up because the next line after the verse I quoted here talks about you know, and this is Christ talking to his apostles. You know, whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth is loose in heaven, right? So after telling mm-hmm. them, you know, and I take your point about this. You know, after telling them how to resolve these disputes. And then talking about sin in this case, I do think it applies to doctrine as well, because it's disagreement, but I, I take your point. I think you got a good point there. He then tells the apostles, right? Whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth is, is loose in heaven. This is the idea, right? That of course is the root of, you know, infallibility. This idea that Christ gave his 
apostles, the, the, the ability to bind and loose, right? This is, an, of course, an ancient, like, Jewish saying, an ancient Jewish power that, like, the leaders, uh, you know, in in the of the Israelites would have would have had as that nation grew, right? These leaders that have the ability to to bind and loose, right? To say mm-hmm. who's in, who's out, what we believe, what we don't believe, right? The, the Catholic Church believes that that passed down through the apostles into their successors and down through to today, right? So that the the gathering of all the bishops of the world, which are the successors of the apostles, can sit in councils and make decisions on things that right impact on on Catholics that we believe right and i think to a degree we all believe that right because we there are ecumenical councils that define things like the trinity right that that mm-hmm. put that gave us lists of the books that were in the bible that then we read and, and passed down right and then that that that's where that authority came mm-hmm. to do those things the issue of infallibility i think I mean, there's there's layers to this. So there's different kinds of infallibility, right? The Pope mm-hmm. can speak ex cathedra, right? From the seat of Peter, right? From the, the authority that Peter had, the special authority Peter had that Catholics believe was passed down mm-hmm. in, in, in the papacy, right? The Pope has that certain ability to define things when he speaks a certain way, when he says, you know, I'm defining this based on that authority that, oh my God, I hope I actually have, like, here's what I'm going to say, right? And then he'll, he'll teach something. So there's that kind of infallibility. There's like the ordinary infallibility of the church not to fall into error, right? The gates of hell won't prevail over the church. That's again, one of those promises that Christ gave to Peter and the apostles. So the, the ordinary sense that this church is infallible in that it won't be overcome by by sin or scandal and disappear right Mm -hmm. and and the church what i would say with that being visible is that the church from the earliest again this is the the early church aspect of of my own conversion right the church from the earliest infancy recognized that the church was a visible thing that was connected to your bishop in succession with the apostles and then the earliest writings we have right are the way that we're told like you know ignatius of antioch says the way Mm -hmm. you know where the church is, is the, the, the dudes who are hanging out with the bishop who comes from right. the apostles, right? That's how we know that where the church is. It's, it is this visible thing, not just guys saying the same thing, but actually guys under the authority of, of that bishop. In terms of like the number of times the Pope has spoke infallibly, I feel like this is a bit, and not that you're doing this intentionally, but a bit of a red herring sometimes. And people will, will I would I would honestly love to know, yeah I would love to know why because I'm it's really not me trying to like I didn't look up on ChatGPT what question should I ask <laughs> Keith or whatever it'd be there this yeah was, it would be there right? this, this this was literally a curiosity of mine that yeah well, um, and, in reading yeah yeah and this is a thing that so first of all it's a thing sometimes that's thrown around by people who are just trying to say look the Catholics just can't agree they can't even agree if it was seven or eight times the Pope has, the Pope has spoken infallibly. Right, which okay, it's it's a good point, right? If if you have an infallible teaching office, you should know how many times or how, what things are infallible, right? Yeah, you should. One of the one of the the caveats with that is that that's a thing that has, that's developed, right? We believe, like in the same way that many things in Christianity have developed over time, right? The, our understanding of the Trinity took like three hundred years to actually work out. And in authoritative councils, right, those mm-hmm. bishops from the from the apostles, kind of worked that out, and kind of Christianity just has believed that since, right, with some caveats. But again, like the idea of what the Pope is in full scope wasn't like delivered to Peter by Christ, like verbatim, right? The, the Church took time to understand what that office was, what it what it means. And often in many cases, and this again was a misconception that I had, in many cases in Catholicism, things aren't defined until that practice is kind of challenged. Right. Right. Yeah. Which is I which is I think like I think that that makes sense. I think that's a, a worthy practice versus saying we believe all these ten things that were delivered mm-hmm. to us on a silver platter and they can't be misunderstood, mm-hmm. right? The church searches its soul when things come along to go, okay, so what have we believed about this now that this thing right. is being challenged, right? So I think I think part of the idea of not knowing exactly precisely how many times the Pope has spoken infallibly is a bit of a product of 
that idea of what it means to speak infallibly and and sure. kind of the scope of the pope that's kind yeah of, yeah <laughs> has kind of not not necessarily changed again that's a red flag thing that you and mm-hmm. would go whoa 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 the pope is changing that understanding has has developed and as challenges yeah. are are raised right the church goes okay so what do we mean by that right where mm-hmm. this here's a challenge against like you know there, uh, there's this issue of this unity in the church and this has happened in history that you know the the bishop of rome the pope has said hey guys if you're not going to follow me you're not going to be part of the church because there's guys breaking off doing crazy weird things here he's not saying as a power grab you must follow the pope he's saying as a figure of unity you got to cling to this you know this church right that he's not saying infallibly you guys aren't saved he's saying in that moment you know sure. here's here's the deal for the sake of christian unity right and that's and that is like a stage of development along the road to what the what the pope is right a- after that we begin to understand like okay so right and that has roots in the ancient church too like you know Irenaeus talked about the that being the most important kind of office yeah. so i think and you know that's a long way of answering again i'm not an apologist as you can tell this is a long no, way of no, answering no. Kind of your question no, but i great. think it of course it is important to know when the pope has spoken infallibly mm-hmm. if that office mm-hmm. is going to be practiced practiced yeah. in the way just the pope infallible i, I think isn't necessarily a, a big deal because that's just one aspect of that infallibility but you know it sure. it does of course it makes sense you you should know that and i think there is agreement amongst amongst catholics and the church and it isn't as if those times when there's questions they're they're big issues it's not like oh did the pope actually speak infallibly to define this this dogma this marian dogma like no no, no. we know the times that he spoke infallibly that were important times and when he's mm-hmm. not speaking infallibly right we, we know those times it isn't as if there's big questions that are left hanging in the air over we're not sure when he spoke infallibly yeah and i think for i think for me the issue was that that mechanism existed where the bishops the pope could speak infallibly and define things mm-hmm. and i and I, and that made more sense to me historically logically you know, from scripture, then the then not having that, then trying yeah. to work out this kind of disunity that we had amongst Protestant Christianity, trying to use our Bible and and, and interpret that, if if that makes mm. sense. Yeah, that no, was a long answer. To yeah, that, no, no, that's, that's great. Funny. That's great. No, you, you know, something I mentioned in the, I think the video that I think had spurred on the conversation of doing the podcast together was. You know, and I was trying to keep it to 90 seconds, which is almost impossible. But, you know, you're trying to. Yeah, it is what it is. It's social media. But I had said I recognize that, you know, um, the Apostle Peter had a unique role. But just because I recognize he had a unique role, I don't see how that unique office or authority is passed down. I just don't see it there. Maybe, you know, maybe my mind changes. And I said similar to the Apostles. Now, I could see how that I you know, could have been confusing. I had a lot of comments and DMs saying, you don't think the apostles, you know, passed on any sort of authority. And I said, in my head, I'm going, (laughs) no, but they didn't pass on apostolic authority, you know, you know, uh, one for one. We didn't have more apostles. And then, you know, so, um, but with that, with apostolic succession and the idea of visible authority going back and, you know, and just to comment earlier on what you said, you know, I don't think it's like the nail in the coffin, like if if it's seven, eight, or nine and there's disagreement. That was literally just a genuine curiosity of mine. Yeah, and yeah, I thought yeah. maybe, maybe this is just a tension to be managed versus a problem to be solved at the moment. But um when I th- you mentioned, I think it was Irenaeus, and when he's talking about, you know, um apostolic succession, to me it makes sense. Now you can try to feel free to poke a hole in this sure. if you think I, I can't hold weight here. But it makes sense to me. He's dealing with heretics. This is in the early, early church. And um, this is a common way that philosophers and people would, you know, argue back then. Well, no, I was trained by the guy who was under, you know, Plato or whatever. Yeah. And so that, that, that makes total sense. Now, I think it was uh, Tertullian who basically said, um, 
when it comes to apostolic succession, if if some heretic was ordained by somebody within that lineage, who cares? He's a heretic. And if somebody's preaching solid biblical doctrine, you know, that's not how he said it, but you you get what I mean. If he's, someone's preaching solid, solid bi- biblical doctrine over here and he's not part of the lineage, who cares? It's solid biblical doctrine. Now, I know the, the problem with the whole church history debate sometimes is, and I this is what's frustrating, I'm sure for you and for me, is just we could just drop bombs picking and choosing because it's never as it's not as clear as anybody wants to, hopes and wishes it was. It's just messy, you know. Um, I have a commentary with a bunch of origin stuff in there. And I'm like, I remember reading for the first time, and some of it I was like, oh my gosh, this guy is brilliant. How did you write this so long ago? And then there was other things I was like, whoa. <laughs> What is happening? <laughs> it's just not crystal clear all the time with all those things. Yeah. It's just not all black and white. So, um, but with that, I think apostolic made made se- you know made uh, sense in the early church. We don't have the Bible as we have it now, um, and heresies flying left and right. Gnosticism is the biggest threat to the church it's ever you know yeah, that yeah. that was ever there. But I don't know if that is necessary for all of eternity. Part of me thinks that God's providential hand was guiding and keeping this thing going. Um, and I'm, I kind of agree with Tertullian. You can tell me where that might be an issue or where you have uh, a problem with that though. Yeah. So I'm, I'm curious uh, when you think that would have ended then, right? So well, if you, so if yeah. you can, so I, I think you're giving, I think you're, I think you're allowing for the fact that there was this system. And I think it's pretty clear we see this for quite a while in the early church, right? The way you know, you know, you're not the heretic, you know, because there was no, like you said, there was no Bible to refer to necessarily to test yourself against here the scriptures that we've affirmed, Mm -hmm. right? Was that you were cleaving to a bishop that had succession with the apostles. And in many cases, you were confessing in the real presence of Christ, that the flesh that hung upon the cross and died is the same flesh that we consume in the Eucharist. Those are kind of the two tests that many early church fathers kind of bring up for how you know, you know you're know, you in the right church versus all the heretics. So I think if we grant, then this was a question I had, right? if we grant that was a framework for the early church and we see it going quite a ways, when was it, when did that paradigm shift? Right? Well, yeah. And that's the same or question. That's the same question I'd have for somebody who's saying, like, you know, soul scriptura is the thing. Okay. Because mm-hmm. we can see that it wasn't always the thing, right? Because there wasn't a scriptura until a certain time in church history. So mm-hmm. when did that paradigm shift? And I guess my little, like, my fault is, and shouldn't it be clear? Shouldn't we all know when that shifted? Because if this is God in this movement, shouldn't it be clear that there was a shift from the apostolic paradigm to it being okay as long as the apostle you're under is is teaching orthodox ideas that makes sense yeah no that's a good question it, to me it feels a little bit a little bit like asking what day did i hit puberty <laughs> it's like um i don't know there was a change at some point it didn't feel gradual at the moment but looking back it probably was sure, that's a good example. uh but at this point something's different you know so i don't know exactly <laughs> when that paradigm shifts but i will say and you can tell me if you disagree with this um because I, I, i'd be curious but i feel pretty confident in this um that when i've looked at any of the early church followers or whoever it might be writing on apostolic succession and sort of the point of this discussion that we're having right now, it seems to me that is always to back up their claim of truth versus heresy, not, um, how would I say it? Um, sacramental authority, if that makes sense. So it's, it has, it, it's less to do with who can administer the sacraments and who's part of an institutional church, although I think there's an element of that there. But I think the emphasis is more, um, this person is saying Jesus Christ didn't have a body. We are saying he does. And we're pointing to scriptures. And not only do we have, not only are we pointing to the scriptures, but by the way, this guy knew John and that that's what John taught. And so um, I would I would imagine though, the Roman Catholic perspective, you can tell me if this is wrong, would say no we agree with that but 
it also has something to do with sacramental authority to administer the sacraments. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. I don't know. It, that that feels a little bit like, yeah, saying the same thing. And maybe I'm not understanding you all, all the way, but certainly those things were, were tied up together often, right? And I think to me, what was very like illustrative, illustrative, is that, I don't know how to say that word, was, you know, th these same arguments are brought up again at the Reformation, right? St. Francis de Sales, you know, one of my favorite saints, uh, you know, in, in exile, he's Bishop of Geneva, the hotbed of Reformation theology, writing in exile, right, is is writing to the reformers and those who are who are converted out of Catholicism into Protestantism. And he's saying these same kind of things, right? He's saying, well, who gave you the authority you know, to plant this church here and start this church. Like, you know, which bishop gave you the authority to do that, mm -hmm. right? So what, what interests me about the idea of the, of the succession argument, right, is that it wasn't just, we can see in history, it wasn't just times when there was Gnostics and there was there were heresies in the early church, right? That, that then becomes this, the thing that bishops are bringing up again at the Reformation to say, Wait, who gave you the authority to, you know, celebrate baptism that way? Do the Lord's Supper that way? Start your church over there? Like, you know, which bishop was it, mm -hmm. right? Which is interesting to me that, you know, when I, when I encountered that, I went, you know what? Yeah, because that wasn't the paradigm I operate under as an evangelical, right? We just, you know, you had a denomination, you went and planted churches, you started churches and stuff. To see that at the time when that first began to be a thing, right? When there's mm -hmm. when there was this visible break off from the the one visible church. Of course, the Orthodox schism is a thing as well that has to be grappled with when you're looking at these things in history, right? But that, that succession was again an, an active live thing when people began to lead the church and yeah. kind of make their own, right? Yeah, but you know, I think, um, and I know this is a hypothetical, so maybe this is not worth um, digging too deep into, but even with Luther and, and the bishop writing saying, who gave you the authority to do this? Even if, even if another bishop had given Luther authority to do it, you know, there's still, there's still a bigger issue here. The next question is not, Oh, okay. <laughs> or, you know, that's not, that's not the response. Yeah. You go do your thing. Uh, the next question is th we're looking to the Christian tradition. We're, we're, we're going to make a theological stance and argument here. We're going to use reason, you know, all, all, all those different things. And then we're, so apostolic succession for me, like I, I honestly feel like if um, if I were to convert to the Roman Catholic tradition, um, and maybe this would change, but apostolic succession just, just does not feel like this massive domino. And maybe it's just from the stuff I've seen online, but it feels like that's a huge touch point. And again, maybe I just I haven't thought about it enough, but um for what it's worth, it yeah, it feels like the pendulum could still swing either way, if you will. Um, I, I think it's, in, if I could just jump in, I don't want to interrupt yeah. you. Yeah. I, I think one thing here is, I think you mentioned this too, is the idea, well, okay, there can be some some bishops who might say, yeah, you, you go and do that, right? And of course there are, like, succession doesn't mean infallibility, right? So one single right. bishop, like one single church father, isn't like an infallible case for for anything, right? Like in the, the, the Arian, you know, heresy, crisis, right? Most of the bishops of the world were mm -hmm. Arians, right? We're believing what we now see as a heresy, right? right. The, about Christ's nature. But the, the church in its authoritative capacity came together in councils and those bishops were, you know, overruled by the other bishops. The Holy Spirit guided those councils towards what we now would say is orthodox belief, right? And this yeah. is the same reason why Paul can correct Peter, right? If Peter is the first pope, we see Paul correcting him and then bragging that he that that he corrected the rock, Cephas, right? He's bragging about this in in scripture because you know those bishops aren't aren't infallible, right? But that the church as a whole won't fall into error. Right, but those bishops can right. I think that's a, that's a, that's a nuance. Maybe that again. Yeah, that's this a, for you. <laughs> this for you, right? You're saying it's not necessarily a no. I, a no, felt I, need. So I, I think no. I think it's a I think it's a valid point. Um, I guess the only thing I was trying to say was I don't need to be convinced of of um, 
apostolic succession to convert. Sure. Um, that 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 would be a, a, a later tier. But let me just ask you this: so yeah, yeah. I was making the I was making the case that in which I think you agreed with that in the early church it made sense. It was very clear. Yeah. And the primary purpose of appealing to apostolic succession was to combat heretical claims. Okay. So in your estimation, what what is the function? Is it just that they have the institutional authority of the church? Or what is the function of apostolic? What is the uh, purpose for it today? Um, I think that would be the that would be yeah. the one hiccup for me where I go, okay. I mean, we have, if I'm speaking as Roman Catholic, we, we have the councils, we have the magisterium. What does it matter so much as to, you know, if bishops are not infallible, what is the purpose of apostolic secession today? So are you, so are you saying that we could have bishops that, that, see, I don't see, I guess I don't see another way of doing that, right? Because the bishopric, like that authority just keeps being passed down. So you couldn't have like a new council to rule on a new issue without having bishops sure. in that council, right? So those bishops couldn't be just a dude who goes, I'm a bishop, I'm gonna I'm gonna join this, right? Right. right. That that those bishops must be guys who are who are in succession to rule on new things. So I think that's maybe a, a function of it. And also I think the visible the visibility that that function, right? Like my friend Joe Heschmeyer wrote a book all about the papacy and it, he says the the distinct nature of the papacy is that it is the one thing, and this I think expands to bi the bishops of the Catholic Church, mm -hmm. right? Being being under a bishop, being in a church that has a picture of the bishop on the wall somewhere next to the Pope, because we do these kind of weird things, right? Of course, we pray to them and we offer sacrifices to these pictures on of the. No, we don't do those things. I'm just joking. I was gonna say. I'm, I'm to pretty sure it. you're a lot of joking, but <laughs> Ooh, the cat's out of the bag, Austin. Right. The reason we have that is so you know because we recognize that this church is under the authority of that of that bishop. All right, in in communion with all the other bishops of the world, and that's the that's a visible kind of unity, and that's the way we can know if we're in or if we're out mm -hmm. of that church we believe that Christ founded. That we're under a bishop, just like you know Ignatius said, like in like one hundred five, right? The same principle applies, I think, just so we can know if if we're in or if we're out, and. I think Joe's argument that I love is like, what else is there to unify around, right? We have oh. we have scriptures as Christians, but we don't have a visible unity around scripture because we disagree and we fracture and we and we fragment. So his argument was that those bishops, that Pope as the as the head of the bishops, right, is that singular thing that we can actually have a visible unity around. But I think would be would be his argument. I, th I think I hope yeah. I hope Joe doesn't disagree with me. And uh, forgive me if I if this comes across ignorant. It, it might be. Um, I, I don't. I'm I'm trying to grasp the idea of uh, the the bishop of Rome being the unifier. Yeah. Um, and not because not because it's like well I I don't see a verse that says that you know like not not because of that. But um, I, when just when I do read the New Testament and I see anything about unity, I haven't seen any a, anything that that I can remember off the top of my head regarding authority. Now I don't, that doesn't mean I don't think that authority doesn't have a role to play in there, but I don't I don't um, see it as uh, a biblical idea, and I could be wrong of having authority being the centerpiece that's going to kind of keep some of the glue together because i mean people can you know obviously criticize different denominations and whatnot of fracturing and stuff and and some of that is so hardcore caricatured on either side yeah, that it's yeah, almost just sure. like geez let's just take a chill pill there's there's been fractures in every tradition yeah some are worse than others no, you know nobody's nobody's neglecting that but um, there's no picture perfect model that has not had any sort of splinters, if you will. Um, so yeah, I just, I just, I, I, I'm struggling to get there. I just go, I don't see the, how the Bishop of Rome is the unifier, and and I'm not, and I, I'm not trying to say this tongue in cheek. Yeah. Whether it's 
Pope Francis or the next Pope, I, and, and maybe I'm just misunderstanding how you articulated it. I don't see how that's the unifier. Yeah. I, um, do you mean doctrinally? I go, well, okay. Um, I, I I have some issues. Like, what does that mean? How, how could it be unified other than anything doctrinally? Is that, does that make sense? Yeah. How does it so. unify the church? Yeah, I think so. I think it's, it's a visible touchstone, right? I think the, the argument would go something like, okay, so as a Catholic, I believe that when Christ, you know, said to Peter, you know, mm -hmm. on this, on this rock, mm -hmm. I am starting, I'm starting my church. He meant, yes, Peter's faith, but he also meant Peter quite literally, you know, he changes his name to rock. Right. And the early, the earliest uh, testimony to that, you know, in the early church fathers kind of, uh, you know, underpins that, right. What that means, the parameters of that, of course, you know, that again, I mentioned before kind of develops in a sense that the church begins to understand that. Right. And it's not, a, I don't think a matter of authority being what unifies, but that, that idea, the idea of the, the bishops with one bishop as its head, as like the representative of Christ on earth is the thing that can help you to know if you're in or if you're out of that visible church, right? That, that you know, that of course assumes that there is a visible church to be in or out of. And again, I think I would, from history, I think that that's, that's I think the reality of how Christians were, were living. I don't think it's a matter of, of, unity. I mean, I guess the sense of authority comes in because you have to have some way of of forcing that unity. You have to have some kind of principle of applying Matthew 18. You have to have some kind of way of, of knowing who's, who's, you know, what the bounds of orthodoxy are. Yeah. I mean, Does that makes sense. And, and that's, yeah. where the, that's where the bishops with one guy who can ultimately settle that, who, who's, who, who wields that authority, right? as the successor of, of Peter, mm -hmm. right? I think that's where that comes in. Not that authority necessarily is what unifies, but it's required to, to say, sure. okay, who's part of this unity and, and who's not, right? I can read, you know, the catechism, the, the document that the, the church has produced, the kind of outline what Catholics believe, right? I can look at that and I can say, okay, the people who aren't following these things they can call themselves Catholic all they like, but they're not actually practicing the Catholic faith. Mm -hmm. I, can, I can easily say that, right? Mm -hmm. I think for me, the kind of the, the thing that drew me in was I can't do the, the same thing with a Bible because, you know, we have the same Bible and there's, and we disagree on what baptism does. We disagree on, on how we're saved. Can we lose that? Can we not? We have, we have, you know, you have Calvinists, you know, you have Arminians who disagree, right? Mm -hmm. And I think the difference, the difference is you can argue of those things. The Catholic Church goes, no, 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 here's what we authoritatively have decided upon, you know, what, what scripture means, the tradition we were passed on, here's what it is, you know, take it or leave it, right? There's right. not that same. And that doesn't mean you won't see debates within the Catholic faith, right? There's a lot, there's, there's, there's scores of theologians in the Catholic faith for, for a reason. They can debate things and discuss things and disagree, but at the end of the day, you know that that beacon of the the papacy, the bishops united under the under the pope or or with the pope, that's that's the arbiter that says no no, no here's what we believe it's in the catechism, you guys can disagree, mm -hmm. but this is this is what it is, yeah. right? It's it's kind of, it's a very different paradigm from anything I think that is found in kind of Protestant Christianity, and that's why I think that kind of a, that authority structure is what's so distinct about the Catholic Church and why you know, what allows for, for unity. Does that make sense? I, it does. I'm trying to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, it's right. So, okay, t t <laughs> two things. I've done really good at taming my tongue, not because I thought oh, I shouldn't bring this up, but just because I went, if I open up this can of worms, we're, we're not going to, like when you start talking about the Reformation, I'm like, oh, there's so much we should talk about. <laughs> but maybe that's for another time. Um, okay, t two things on that. Um, I better, I think I better understood as you explained that where you were coming from. Um, and Again, if you just want to go, hey, we don't have time for that. We'll keep going or whatever. Feel free because I know I'm about to drop some stuff. But when, <laughs> when, like, I, when I look when I look through the New Testament, um, multiple times in Acts, in uh, Philippians, I, I can't remember if it's First or Second Thessalonians. Whenever it's talked about any sort of authority structure or people over 
those different congregations, we actually, most of the time, I think we see multiple um, yeah. elders or bishops or, you know, whatever over each of these. And so I go, were they, you know, uh, as I'm listening to you, I'm going, were they unified? Were they not unified? <laughs> you know, um, how, do, how does that work? But beyond that, there was something else I was going to bring up. And um, I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? Hopefully I remember my second point. But Yeah, no, no, I th- absolutely. And I think this is one of those kind of those, those points of, you know, you, you, you see a very infant church in, in Acts, right? In, mm-hmm. in Paul's epistles, that seems like there are different authority structures that have given different names. Um, those names of those authority structures, like you know, priest, you know, deacon, bishop, those names, I think, very quickly solidify. And we see in the earliest church fathers, you know, we see in Clement of Rome, a clear distinction or understanding of, hey, he, these offices correspond to these Old Testament offices in the Old Testament priesthood. Certainly, as that develops, we, we see that even clearer. Like, you know, Jerome makes this point very clear in one of his letters that this threefold ministry of, of deacon, or sorry, of, of bishop, priest, and deacon is a, is a throwback directly to the Old Testament, you know, priesthood, Levitical priesthood. This is kind of the new fulfillment of this. And there's all kinds of books I could recommend that touch on these things too. But I think, right, the, the picture of, of Acts that we see, again, is this development of understanding. So yeah, there were, I think, first of all, kind of colleges or like groups of priests or of elders governing these churches, right? Mm-hmm. And as the, church, as the Christian world expanded, right, you know, Jerome tells us in his letters, and he's not too far away, from this. He's not like a, a, a super late guy looking back like thousands of years. Jerome tells us that in response to the some of the issues that Paul writes about in his epistles of, you know, I'm cleaving to Barnabas because he baptized me. I'm, you know, I'm Paul's because he baptized me and so on and so on. That those kind of groups of priests who were governing those churches, the, the plurality of elders governing those churches, were quickly solidified into one kind of bishop per area, and those bishops kind of in unity, kind of made up that made up that church. So, so maybe for the first, and I think he puts this at like fifty years or something. It's pretty early on, according to Jerome, that there was kind of a plurality governing those churches. Sure. And because of disputes where they couldn't agree on, right, who they were following out of that plurality, they appointed one person kind of per per church. Mm-hmm. And then we see that kind of in the writings of the early church fathers, right, where, where yeah, there's there are a bunch of priests, there are deacons, there's sometimes multiple bishops, perhaps, in mm-hmm. in in one church, in one context, because those words were somewhat interchangeable sometimes. But there is one you know, one bishop, one one priest, one presbytero, one, you know, in charge of those church. And that emerged pretty quickly, I think. Is that, is sure. that, does that answer your yeah. question? <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's fair. Um, okay. I don't know how much time you have, but there was, I don't want to, there was one thing I would, um, I remember what I was going to say earlier and I thought, oh, yeah, I, would yeah. lo- I would love to hear your thoughts. Yes, on this. we can do this. I, yeah. I don't want to go down the whole rabbit trail because there's so many videos on it, so many books on Sola Scriptura. Um, but I, we've been talking about authority. We have talking about, you know, settling disputes and doctrinal division, etc. And one, um, I kind of have a series of questions. They're not like gotcha questions or anything like that, but I'm, <laughs> ju- I'm, I'm curious because there have been times where I've wondered if, um, if we strip away what the fringe, you know, um, the fringe arguments that come from soul scripture that makes everybody cringe. That's, you know. That, yeah, that we all go, please stop talking. If we just strip away that, um, if there's a dispute between, you know, two bishops, or if the Pope hypothetically were to say something, and it seems as if he's teaching, he's he's about to say something ex cathedra, and he says something that is off the wall or or whatever, wouldn't um, if if it was going contrary to something that was evident in scripture, wouldn't the case be made not based on um, any sort of hierarchy within authority, but wouldn't another bishop have the grounds to confront 
what was being said just based on a um, evident, you know, what am I trying to say? Something completely false that is evident in scripture. Sure. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes, I think so. And I think, I think yes is the answer. <laughs> so, so then, so then, you know, the famous thing I see in comments, and I don't make Catholic, like Roman Catholic. I think I've made two of my whole life about Roman Catholicism. Yeah. I try to be charitable. They're good. They're good. But um, I sometimes want, you know, it's always, well, who gave the Bible? I'm, you know, and yeah, honestly, yeah. when just when people just put that in the comments, I almost, I'm like, <laughs> nice. I've never heard that. I've never <laughs> thought of that. <laughs> I have no idea. I have no, I have no answer for you. Yeah. I'm yeah. done. Yeah. You're Zing. right. Yeah. 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 Ooh. Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> yeah. That's maybe the maybe, argument. You, maybe, hey, you know what? Yeah. Because you were mentioned this earlier. Maybe I should just go, how many times has the church infallibly? No, I'm just kidding. Like that would be the equivalent. <laughs> yes, like, yes, kind of like, yeah. okay, really? Yeah. Um, but uh, the reason I asked that is because uh, when when people condemn Sola Scriptura as Scripture being the only infallible source, my issue was when I look, and maybe I just have a misunderstanding, but when I look at some of the um, disputes that have happened within Roman Catholicism, just like in all the other traditions, yeah, they're, they're calling back to Scripture. And so I go, maybe on paper, holy tradition the seed of Peter and scripture, they're different, distinct. Um, maybe they serve even different roles in a nuance, but they're all God breathed in the Roman Catholic view or they're, yeah, they're God's yeah. words. But I go, I wonder if functionally it, it's actually a little bit closer in some sense to what I'm thinking, because wouldn't they, they're not going to argue based off of anything other than scripture if it's a matter of scripture. Am I right in that or am I wrong in that? Yeah, yes. I think you're entirely right and I think the I mean there have been there, there have been say like I'll call them developments in the Catholic faith that have steered that further away from from what 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 allows Protestants to be comfortable, right? Things about Mary, these kind of things seem to stray from scripture. And and I think then you go, well, okay, they're not following the Bible anymore, right? That's always the, of course, when I do videos, that's what it's thrown at me, right? You're not even following the Bible anymore. You, you've just ignored the Bible and that's not important to you anymore, right? That's a, that's a lung the church breathes with, right, is the Bible. There's also tradition, like that's what's, what's handed on from the apostles, right? Uh, and and that's, that's things like, okay, well, so how do we, in often cases, it's things like, how do we interpret or understand that scripture? Right. So at the end of the day, like the, the kind of the paradigm of the Catholic Church is that, yeah, like, you know, scripture is uniquely that written deposit of faith that came from the apostles. Right. It's like mm -hmm. it's unique in that sense. Right. That it was it's a thing we have that written testimony that, that's, that's passed on. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of what we call tradition is then the church wielding its ability, its authoritative ability from the apostolic succession piece, that magisterium, that teaching office to interpret that scripture that's passed on, mm -hmm. right? In many cases, I think. So like the function of the church being able to bind and loose, right? Is often, well, it's binding and loosing things that are found in scripture, right? Or, and this is again, where, where I think we run into some confusion maybe in some some trouble is that the church is okay saying if something isn't necessarily condemned in scripture mm -hmm. it's not something that that we that we maybe are okay doing like so so you know you're not going to find in scripture this idea you know written out clearly you know unmistakably that Mary stayed a virgin for the rest of her life, right? After she, right. you know, gave birth to Jesus. Right. You won't find that spell that like Paul's not going to say, oh, by the way, Mary didn't have any more children, remained a virgin, right? Was assumed into heaven at the end of her life or whatever. You won't find that spelled out like, like that in scripture. The, the, what the church would say is like, you know, we, we believe that we believe that because there, there are seeds of that 
in mm -hmm. scripture. There's reasons why we think she's the Ark of the Covenant. We think she's the new Eve. We think these things about Mary that entail that she remained, remained pure in this sense, right? Didn't have any more, more children, remained a virgin. Right. Right. It was assumed in heaven. There, there are seeds in that in scripture and nothing in scripture that contradicts that. Nowhere that says this, this isn't the case. And if this was passed down, the church would argue from, you know, from very early in the church history, this was believed by Catholics, believed by bishops, right? With, with the, with the, the thought that the church can't go wrong is infallible. This isn't contradicted in scripture. We do find like the roots of this idea in scripture. Therefore, the church can say, okay, this is what we believe. Sure. Right? Does that, does that make sense? Like, it's not yeah. necessarily, yeah, yeah. The, the church would never teach anything that contradicts scripture, right? And, sure. and would argue that the things we do teach are found in some kind of form in that unique deposit of the, but it isn't the, it isn't the only source for I, things that the, the church teaches. I do think this is one of the more, more difficult things for me. One of the more pain points yeah. that I would have to resolve because as far as the Marian dogmas, I've, I've read about them, you know, I'm pretty familiar with them. i you know, probably not as much as you or a lot of your listeners, but, um, it's not as much th those dogmas. I know for a lot of Protestants, that's a, that's a huge problem because in my, you know, in my, in my perspective, I just go, listen, uh, Luther, I'm pretty sure Luther thought Mary remained a virgin yeah, and yeah. other reformers are like it. And on top of that, if I'm convinced that, um, the Pope is who the Roman Catholics claim he is, then that's, that's kind of part of signing up. The issue though, from the outside is why would there be such, um, high demand of agreement on things that are not in scripture where it could be, this is what we teach. And, um, we think this is correct. And maybe it's because the church would never speak on something like that. But, you know, I, I, I almost wonder, like, I, you know, I tell people, hey, I think um, universalism is, is heretical. Yeah. I, I don't believe it's a, it's a biblical idea. I don't believe it lines up with anything in the Christian tradition. Um, my personal belief is that annihilationism uh not all the time, but often is like a slippery slope into liberal theology. Um, not all the time. I, there's a, a, one of my solid friends who's a conservative Christian, theologically speaking, believe, believes in annihilationism. I don't think it's going to take him down that path, but I think it can. But I don't tell people, hey, if you believe in annihilationism, you're wrong. I'm just not convinced of it. I, I almost wonder, what with the Marian dogma, it's not as much about the dogma, but if I go, on stuff like this. And and last part, and then I'm done with my rant, but earlier you had mentioned, and I was familiar with this, but the church typically speaks up on, on with that highest level of authority when there is some sort of pressure or there is a dispute to be made, uh, to, you know, to be figured out. And I, this is asked in complete honesty, I have no clue. What was there something that was happening in the Roman Catholic tradition or in Christianity at large that made uh, the magisterium go? We gotta, we gotta define these Marian dogmas. That would be my first question. I just don't know. And then secondly, is and and maybe this is just something you go. I have symp sympathy for you for, or there's a answer to that. Why is there such a hard shift? I I don't remember the exact language, but it was something like, if you don't believe. It, it was something it was speaking to, if you don't believe the Marian dogmas, you know, you have lost the faith or you're, you're not really, I can't remember the exact verbiage, but it felt so intense. And I just went, it's one thing to propose something or to think, or even to feel confident, but just to make that part of almost, it felt to me from the outside, like, um, we're attaching this to the creed. I know that's not actually how it was, but I, if someone tells me they don't agree with the apostles creed, I just go. Dude, how, do, how you're not, what are you talking about? Um, but this, this is so, such a different level. Okay. I'm done ranting. I gave you two things there. <laughs> it, it was there, was there some sort of history behind the Marian dogmas yeah. coming about? It just seems so random to me, but I don't know. 
And then yeah. why is it such a hard sell? Like you have to accept these wholeheartedly. Yeah, yeah. Those are those are great questions. And like you say, those are the things that and I'll tell you how I mean, this is maybe playing my Catholic cards too openly to some people in the audience, but the reason why I accepted those so easily as an evangelical, and this is this is always the sticking point. And I think, I don't want to caveat this too much, but it's a good sticking point, right? Because the, I call it an allergy to, to idolatry, right? Which I think is a good allergy to have. Like, you know, many evangelicals, right? Anything that resembles any kind of idolatry, you are allergic to. And that's a good, I think a good instinct, right? Because we don't want to fall into idolatry for, in any any part of our lives, right? Sure, so you yeah. see these things like Mary and you go, no, 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 no. I don't want to touch that, that thing, the 10 foot pole. For me- Could I just real quick interject? Yes. I'm sorry. I just want to clarify because I just don't want you to think this. It's not that the Marian dogmas are like I feel allergic to them. Sure, sure. It's more sure. so going. Why would there be such a hard stance right, on yeah, something yeah. if it's if it's not a scriptural matter? Yeah, if, if that makes sense. But yeah, I, I don't no, know. No, yeah. yeah, yeah. No, fair enough. I was just saying that the reason why for me this wasn't such a hard sell for okay. me was that I I tried like asking Mary to pray for me like one time being like, this is a thing, mm. Catholic, I'm gonna try this. And like, huge miracle, like, really, like unmistakable miracle on my first try at, at so I'm, I'm not gonna say like, everyone go home and like pray, ask Mary to pray for you. <laughs> That's a whole other like, sure, kind of yeah. words. the idea of right. how can we ask people who are dead to pray for us, right, 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 this, right, is, right. this is crazy, just yeah. ask Jesus. There's a lot right. in there to yeah. unpack. But for right. me, this was such a non-issue because I, I I tried it and it worked and it was like, oh, okay. So the church is right about this. And you make a good point before too, you said, right, that this is one of those things that if you accept the authority of the, of the church, you can accept the other things that it, that it teaches without yes. actually, you know, I mean, you, you wrestle, the, the, you spend a lifetime understanding those things. And there are still areas of, of those dogmas that I still mm. am uncomfortable around, yeah. but I accept the authority of the church to define those. Uh, on your first point, like historically, this is one of those things that, you know, the church would say, we've believed these things since like the third century and their roots of some of these different teachings, the assumptions certainly in, in the early church, right? In iconography, right? In some, in the, in writings of the church fathers, we, you, you can find these things um, before they're actually defined, right? And I, and willing to lay my cards out and say, I don't know the answer. I don't know the answer mm -hmm. to why some of those dogmas were so rigidly defined when mm -hmm. they were. I know, again, this is probably my my ignorance and maybe this comes across as terrible, but for me, it wasn't a huge issue. So I didn't do a lot of research into yeah. why they were defined when they were, right? I had that at that point accepted they were a reality because Mary was like doing junk when I asked her to pray you know, she was, right. she was, she was on my behalf praying for me and things were happening. I was like, well, this no, is either, yeah. and I, I appreciate either the Satan yeah. or, or there's something happening here. I do know that at the time these things were defined, like in the fifties, in the case of the assumption in heaven, right? In like the 1850s, in the case of the Immaculate Conception. Um, of course, the other things were defined, like the virtual virginity was defined like in the three hundreds, right? At a pretty early ecumenical council, mother of God, which is like the scary title that that we give Mary was mm -hmm. defined like at the Council of Ephesus in like the 400s as a way of defining who Christ was in his nature, right? It was like a Christological yeah, definition yeah. given to Mary, right? The two later ones, right? The Assumption in Heaven in the 1950s, um, I know when that was defined, like, I don't I don't know why it was defined at that time, because it wasn't like some big scandal about her <laughs> assumption, I don't think, like in the church. But I know when it was defined, like I know the the church like surveyed all Catholics around the world, right? I think it actually asked every parish to conduct a survey of the Catholics in that parish and found that like 80% of all Catholics believed this, I think at that time, before it was defined. And I think at that point, the church defined it you know, in that kind of universal infallibility, like if the church can't fall into error, all these Catholics believe this about Mary. So we're going to go ahead and, and, and define this, I think was part of the thinking. Um, again, I don't know mm -hmm. the roots of why, why then, right? In either of those cases, I know there are crazy miracles that surround both of those that kind of 
lend some lend some maybe supernatural credence to like here's like this is true we believe you know that here's some evidence of maybe why this is interesting that's maybe a, mm-hmm. a bit of a sideshow why why it's so hardcore i think is just based on the fact that there are only a few times the church has infallibly declared things right and these are some of those times so mm-hmm. if you're going to be if you're going to be catholic you got to believe that those the church has the power to declare things infallible you know infallibly here are some things that is defined infallibly so you got to you got to believe these things to be catholic otherwise right you're you're not really fully believing the claim of the church mm-hmm. if, if that makes sense yeah. again like no it I don't, I don't know how, like, you know, I mentioned before, I, there are things in that that I'm so uncomfortable with yeah. as, as a Catholic for almost 10 years now, mm-hmm. right? That, that don't, I mean, they don't touch on my day-to-day Catholic life or like yeah. experience as, as a Catholic, you know, and I don't know that like the ordinary, you know, peasant farmer in the field would have understood. Now, I think actually we, we take, we, we give them a bit of a short shift sometimes, those peasant farmers, because I think they knew a lot, like they, their faith was lived out in a real sense that I think often we aren't even touching on, mm-hmm. you know, as modern day, modern day Christians. But I think like those things don't necessarily bear there. Yeah. You got to submit to those things and those things you got to say, yeah, I believe those. I don't disbelieve those. I, I can accept those, but I don't think they really impact necessarily. You get to, you get to have, have those worked out theologically, like really rigorously to just practice the Catholic faith. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, it is. And and maybe it's just our, our our different frameworks, but I just go, man, it's tough to think that any tradition would would say on things that are not like um essentials. And maybe they would say sure. the Marian dogmas are essential, but I I go, it, it can't be more essential than, you know, um than the twelve tenets of the faith outlined yeah. in the Apostles' yeah. Creed. Yeah. So I go what constitutes somebody, whether they're a part, you know, whatever denomination or tradition they're part of, what constitutes somebody as, yeah, they believe and they hold to the core doctrines that Christians have all held to. And so, so I just go to pair other things on that, uh, that are strictly on yeah, yeah, I see. Um, that, that you, I could not weigh or test in any way. Um, because there's not there's not reference to it, and that's why I go the Marian dogs themselves. Th- it's not like some big bomb for me that I'm like, oh, I can't believe it because of that. I do have issue with some. I mean, some of it I just go, okay, well, <laughs> I don't know, you know, I don't, I don't know. But um, it's just more so like adding that to this. Um, sure, sure. You can't. You're not in here <laughs> unless you believe this. It's like okay, um. Why, why are we adding this to, why is it not just, because I know the Catholic church has said, we have different views on this and you can believe what you want, but on these things, you can't believe those. It's like, why can't it just be something like that? But anyways, uh, I appreciate your answer and I appreciate your honesty. Uh, I really do. Yeah. And yeah. this was, this has been a lot of fun. And I, I honestly, like <laughs> we should do a part two um, at some point, because I would love to. I would love to dive deeper into yeah. one of these or on the Reformation or something like that. I think that'd be really fun. Yeah, I, I think absolutely. I mean, look, I mean, I could talk to you for hours, I think. so. Me too. Uh, yeah, it'd be fun. <laughs> definitely. Yes, definitely to be continued uh, if if you're up for Because there's, there's, I am. yes, there's lots and, and lots in there. And hopefully uh, me and my meager attempts uh, as an unprofessional apologist, uh, has at least expressed things appropriately. I'm sure I'll hear uh, in the comments if if I haven't uh, from from both sides. I'll get those Bible zingers and and you'll get those you know zingers your way uh, as we do. But hopefully there'll be some fruitful conversation from this kind of conversation. Um, for for my listeners uh, to the show, maybe give us a bit about where people can find you. You have a podcast, you're active on different, different places. You mentioned you're doing a, you did a couple of Catholic reels. Um, I hold a baby and respond to a couple of your reels, um, which I think the baby is distracting, but I, I'm going for like, 
I'm going for that like that, that, that Catholic grandma audience, pretty hardcore. <laughs> so I feel like the baby really, the, you know, that's that sells to a whole new audience uh, yeah. on Instagram. But where, you know, what do you want to point people towards? Uh, yeah, awesome. you can go to my website, anticatholic.com. No, I'm just kidding, Keith. <laughs> <laughs> just right after we had a cordial discussion. Uh, no, uh, oh no, no. In my in my paradigm, I just go. I don't care if you're Eastern Orthodox or Roman Catholic <laughs> or uh, Southern Baptist. Although I think, well, I should make that joke. <laughs> careful, Anyways, careful, careful. okay. Um, people can find me um, on YouTube or any social media. Just at Austin Mol A U S T I N M O L T. So yeah, that's that's awesome, uh, Austin. Thank you. This has been. A real pleasure, a lot of fun. Uh, honestly, I want to say God bless you, your wonderful family, the work that you're doing, and uh, may a part two in the future if you're up for it. Let's That'd do it, awesome. and God bless you and your family as well. Thanks for having me. Thanks, man. Thanks for being here.